When I first heard that the theme of the conference was Catalyst for Tomorrow, this got me thinking about what a catalyst is. And for me, a catalyst is anything that spurs change. Well, then this just got me thinking about the types of changes I've experienced in my life. And I realized there are two types of changes that I've gone through. The first is a very slow and gradual change. The types of changes that happen over the course of months, years, or even decades. And then there's a second type of change. It's a type of change that is almost instantaneous. It feels like you've been hit with a lightning bolt. And from that moment on, your life will never be the same. It's an epiphany. And today, I'd like to share with you three of the epiphanies that I've had in my life. The first happened when I was 17 years old. I was living in Pakistan. My parents were missionaries, so we traveled a lot. And I was in high school, and I took my first physics class. Just out of curiosity, how many people here have ever taken a physics class before? All right, well, that's most of the audience. That's very impressive. Uh, how many of you actually enjoyed the experience? All right, not, not nearly as many. <laughs> I, I can relate. I've taken probably more physics classes than most of you, being a physicist. <laughs> you would hope, right? They don't just give out degrees for nothing. And I, I can relate to the pain because physics is often very poorly taught. But I was lucky. In high school, my very first physics class, I had someone who inspired me. His name was Mr. Slaw. And I remember one day in class, he walked in, and he said, we're going to do a problem today. And the problem was this. He wrote it down on the board, but it was basically this. Throw a ball up, and you catch it. Now calculate how high the ball goes, how long it spends in the air, and how fast it's going to go when it comes back down. That moment changed my life because I realized for the first time what physics was. Up until that point in my life, the world just kind of happened to me. Sure, I could catch a ball, things happened. I could push things on a swing, but I didn't understand the mechanisms or the rules that guided this. But physics, what physics is, is studying those rules. It's trying to find out the principles and laws for what governs the things around us. And when I realized that the same physics, the same principles and laws that go into throwing a ball up and catching it, those same laws are what keep the Earth moving around the sun. It's the same physics that goes inside of a black hole. It just blew my mind. That year, I became so excited about physics, I just spent all my time trying to calculate everything around me. Uh, later on in the year, our class, we took a field trip up into a northern Pakistani village called Natia Gali. Now, the road to get up to Natia Gali, it has to be one of the most treacherous in the world. It's over a thousand feet down these cliffs into this valley below. The road is incredibly narrow, and there's always rock slides coming in. At one point, a rock slide had taken out part of the road, and our van driver, he had to get out and bring the rear view mirrors in so the van could get close enough to the side of the wall and still our wheels were not fully on the road we were partially off he made all of us get to one side of the van so it wouldn't tumble off into the valley below <coughs> looking back i don't know what my parents were thinking when they filled out the permission form <laughs> there's a several times i i didn't think i was ever going to come back uh, maybe that's what my parents wanted <laughs> So anyway, we got past this really harrowing section of the road, and everybody got out and immediately started throwing rocks down into this river a thousand feet below. I ran back to the van, grabbed my calculator, and started calculating how long that would take for the rocks to fall. So this moment, when I saw this first problem in physics, I knew that that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to study physics. But I also felt a tiny twinge of sadness because up until that moment, I was convinced I was going to be an English major. <laughs> I loved literature, I loved writing, and most of all, I loved poetry. You see, a poet has the almost unique ability to take words to describe something, but then somehow transcend those words. Take, for example, love. 
I think most of us have experienced love in some form or another. And if I were to try and share with you my experiences with love, I'd be up here for hours. But I can say I have 13 minutes left, so I can't quite do that. But a poet can do so very effectively. One of my favorite poems about love was written by Margaret Atwood. And it goes, you fit into me like a hook into an eye, a fish hook and open eye. That's love. <laughs> it captures both the joy and the pain that we feel that love brings. But now I had to leave this world behind. So I went to university. I went to Kingston um, and enrolled in Queens, and I took engineering physics. And I quickly found out that engineering is a very serious business. You are dealing with people's lives. People's lives literally can depend on you. And this was really rammed into me in my first year, in my frosh week, when I, I realized that I would have no more time for any of the fluffy arts anymore. And the engineers, we formed little marauding bands, and we'd go around terrorizing the art students. <laughs> and we would taunt them with the fact that while one day we would have respectable careers and jobs, the only thing that their degree would qualify them for would be to ask me if I would like french fries with that. <laughs> so I began engineering, and I began my program. And I remember I asked one of my professors, I said, what's engineering physics like? And he said, Krister, it is like drinking the finest wine from a fire hydrant. <laughs> And that was very true. I was so overloaded with physics that I almost had my passion for the subject educated out of me. But then I took a quantum mechanics class. Now, up until this point, all the physics I had ever studied had dealt with things like balls, planets, things that I could see or at least relate to or I had some kind of notion and we, we could know the rules of these things. But with quantum mechanics, you're studying things down at the atomic level. You're going way down deep to the smallest scales, to the smallest things in the universe. Atoms, electrons, little bits of light called photons. And the rules that govern how these things behave are completely different. Very strange, very counterintuitive. I'd like to demonstrate one of these things for you. And for this, I, I need a volunteer. Um, excuse me, sir. My name's Krister. I'm Alan. Alan, yeah. it's a pleasure. Are, are you busy? Uh, no. All right, excellent. Can you, you can help me out. So I just need you to stand there, and I have a very technical task for you. I'd like you to catch this ball. All right, let's give Ellen a hand, everybody. All right, I'll take that back. That, that's, that's it, really. All right. So, yeah, again, yes. So um, for Alan to catch this ball, he had to know two things. He had to know both where the ball is and where it was going to go, how fast it was going. So if you know where something is and how fast it's going, well, then you can predict where it's going to be next. And then if you know it's here, then you can predict where it's going to go next. If you know these two things, where something is and how fast it's going. You can sit down. That, that's good. All right. So when you go down to the quantum world, if I were to instead throw an atom to Alan, he would probably have a harder time catching it. And this is because it's impossible. Quantum mechanics forbids us from knowing exactly where something is and how fast it's going. You can, in some sense, know one or the other. So you might say, okay, well, the atom's here. Okay, I'm going to catch up to get it here, and then suddenly it ends up over here, and you can't track the path in the same way. And it's not that we don't have the technology to do this. It's not that we could somehow build a better ruler, but it's a fundamental principle. It's called Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, and it's the law. It's, it's how these things behave. And it's very strange. Nothing in the world behaves this way. I mean, Alan was able to catch the ball. He didn't have it go flying all around the room. So this is the world of, of quantum mechanics. And this Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, it reminds me of this old physics joke. It goes, Heisenberg, he's driving down the road, and the cops pull him over for speeding. And the officer walks up to him, knocks on the window, and Heisenberg rolls down the window, and the officer says, excuse me, sir, do you have any idea how fast you're going? 
Heisenberg says, no, but I know exactly where I am. Every physics joke is a bad joke, so <laughs> I should have warned you. So going back to this moment in class, I had another one of these epiphanies. The prof was up there explaining these ideas. And when I began to see that there was this world all around me that was invisible to my naked eye, but yet the rules behaved so differently, but made up the building blocks of everything in, in the universe, I was overcome with emotion. I remember it was like electricity running through my body. The little hairs on the back of my neck were standing up. I had goosebumps everywhere. I saw that this world was beautiful. And in that moment, I realized something. I realized that physics is a poem that nature has written about how the universe works. All these years, I had thought that but I had to either choose physics or poetry. But now I saw that there was a relation and a connection between them. That it wasn't just poets like Shakespeare or Margaret Atwood who were poets, but physicists like Einstein, Bohr, Heisenberg, Newton, they were poets too. And I realized that I wanted to study quantum mechanics. I wanted to become a quantum physicist because by studying that, I too could become a poet. And so that's what I did. I went to graduate school, got a PhD in something called quantum optics where I use light to test things like the uncertainty principle. And now I work here at the University of Waterloo at the Institute for Quantum Computing. And I love my job. Every day I get to go in and play in this quantum world. And what we're trying to do at the Institute for Quantum Computing is build the type of technologies, lay the groundwork for the things that aren't going to happen tomorrow, but 20, 50, and 100 years from now. But that's not the end of the story. You see, when I was in graduate school, I had another epiphany. And this one happened one night when I went out to a local jazz club called the Reservoir Lounge. A friend and I went out, and the band was playing, and the music was just amazing. So I had to get up and dance. So I got up, and I was dancing. I, I wasn't so much dancing as flailing myself at the music. But then this couple got up, and they started doing this partner dance. And I, I was just bowled over. I ran up to them afterwards. I said, what are you guys doing? <laughs> they looked at me and said, we're doing a swing dance. It's, it's called the Lindy Hop. I knew in that moment that I was a dancer. <laughs> I, I was, didn't have the technique down, but, but I knew that's what I wanted to do. It, it was like there was a missing puzzle piece in my life that had finally slotted in. It was a puzzle piece that I never knew was missing. But now, I was whole. So I ran home that night. I was so excited I couldn't sleep, I stayed up all night on the internet researching this Lindy Hop. And the next morning, I had come to three conclusions. I was going to quit physics, move to Sweden, and become a professional dancer. <laughs> After I overcame my sleep deprivation, I uh, realized that maybe that's not the best idea. So instead, I spent the next year, every waking hour, dancing. I was at Dance clubs, dance classes, you name it. My physics suffered, because I wasn't in the lab very much, and I felt really guilty about this, because I felt like I was being a bad physicist. But there's a saying that you should never let a university get in the way of your education. <laughs> and that's certainly the case for me. You see, dancing opened me up. Chelsea gave us this lovely talk about how she got her heart out of a box, Dancing is what got my heart out of a box. All my life, I thought the question I was trying to address, the question that I wanted to answer, was how does the world work around me? But dancing showed me that the real question I was trying to answer was who am I? And physics seemed like the perfect way to address this. After all, I am made up of atoms and electrons and all these particles that then form my biological systems. 
And the rules that govern those things are the same things that govern stars and other things in the universe. And so by understanding those things, I could understand something about myself. And it's a very beautiful viewpoint of who I am. But suddenly, dancing gave me a different perspective. You see, if you did something like this and a little movement, I could understand the physics of that turn. But dancing gave me another insight into it. Both dancing and physics provided two different insights, two different windows into who I am. And this affected me so deeply, I, I began to understand that my definition of what a poem was, what it meant to have poetry, was so limited before. For me, poetry became anything that provided insight into who I am. And that split me open. I began to see this poetry in everything around me, see this beauty in everything around me. Even mundane things, like washing the dishes, sweeping the floor, or doing my budgeting, were beautiful because they provided insight into aspects of who I am, little windows. And then I began to realize that everybody around me was doing this too. Everybody I met, the stories they told, the things that they did, the actions that they took, how they treated me, how they treated others, all of that was connected to me. It provided other little windows of insight into who I am. It isn't just Einstein or Shakespeare who are poets, but everybody I meet, I realized, is a poet. I began to understand that life itself is a poem, that the act of living is poetry. And that was very humbling for me. But it's also something that's so easy to take for granted. For example, I really don't like doing dishes that much. You can ask my wife. But when I have to do the dishes, what I do is I go over and I put on a little swing song. I do a little dance. And that... <laughs> I was told this wouldn't happen. That connects me very deeply into myself, into who I am. And I'm filled with joy. Dancing takes me there. And then doing the dishes is no longer something that's a hassle or a chore, but it becomes something that I enjoy. Three things in my life, dancing, physics, and poetry, have deeply changed me. They've opened me up to myself in ways that I never would have thought possible. They've shown me how I'm connected to everyone and everything around me. And finally, they've taught me that today I have something to learn from each and every one of you. And for that, I'd like to thank you.